Greetings viewers and welcome to a fresh perspective on the biblical figure Adam. In this video we'll explore an alternative interpretation that considers a historical Adam, harmonizes with scientific understanding, and does not challenge the perspectives of New Testament writers. Join us as we delve into an innovative approach to the Adam narrative, examining its symbolism and universal themes that resonate across cultures and the human experience. Now, many theologians would argue that Adam is an archetypal figure. Now, I would like to propose uh, my basic view of dealing with Adam and Eve is to understand them in archetypal ways. The idea would be that everything in Genesis 2 concerned with the human origins is archetypal in nature. When I use the term archetypal, I'm not just talking about prototypes. Prototype is the first one in line, off the assembly line, and all the rest come after it, okay, on the same pattern. That's a prototype. In literature, when they talk about archetypes, they're talking about an archetypal sort of character. The villain, the hero, the damsel in distress, the Frodo, yeah, okay. Archetypes of various sorts. Okay, and I'm not really talking about that either, although that has similarity. By archetype, what I'm talking about is that this archetype embodies the whole group. We're all embodied in Adam. We're all doing what Adam is doing. Adam is all of us. That's the archetype idea. Disclaimer, this view is perfectly compatible with there being a literal, historical, first human named Adam that lived 6,000 years ago. This idea of an archetype is a new idea to some, but is not a new idea. It is actually quite ancient. Throughout the ancient Near East, all the stories about creation of humans have to do with archetypes. And they use ingredients, not always dust, but they use ingredients in order to communicate something archetypal about humanity, made from the blood of a god. Uh, that's communicating something. Second Baruch, Ben Sira, and possibly other Jewish authors writing around the time of the New Testament use Adam as an archetype to represent all of humanity. Many scholars argue Paul is using Adam archetypally in Romans 5, 7, and 1 Corinthians 15. When we learn that we all sin in Adam, Paul's treating Adam as an archetype. We're all embodied in Adam. We're all doing what Adam is doing. Adam is all of us. That's the archetype idea. In Romans 5.14, Adam is seen as a type of the one who was to come. Romans 5.12-21 draws parallels between Adam and Christ, highlighting their roles as representatives of humanity, of which we will dive deeper in another video. This scriptural support reinforces the idea of Adam as an archetype. So just as we see an individual man mentioned in Genesis 2-3, it can still be read as a symbolic telling of the experiences we have even today. This argument would say that Paul mentioned the one individual man, just like Genesis 2-3 mentioned the individual man, even if it's possible the authors didn't think there was one individual man. In 1 Corinthians 15, Adam and Jesus are in a long list of other comparisons between the earthly and heavenly body. Adam and Jesus are both mentioned for what they represent. Adam is a representation of our mortal, corrupt, earthly bodies, while Jesus is a representation of our soon-to-be immortal, incorruptible, heavenly body. Dennis Lambrou notes, Here, Adam is called the first man, but in the context of the contrast with Christ has the last Adam. It cannot be seen as a claim that Adam was the first biological specimen. Since Christ was not the last biological specimen, we must instead conclude that this text is talking about the first archetype and the last archetype. We might say that Adam was an initial archetype replaced by the ultimate archetype in Christ. It is insufficient to bring in biology simply because Christ was biologically descended 
from Adam. This is confirmed in the remainder of the passage as it contrasts the natural and the spiritual. The archetypal element of dust is specifically explained as making the archetypal man earthly in comparison to the heavenly nature of Christ. It describes human nature. The biblical point is to contrast and compare Adam to Jesus and our relationship to both. Paul makes no claims about genetic relationships of all people to or about material origins, only that we share the dust, nature of the archetype. In other words, this view would see the story of Adam as a representation for the predicament we are in. What happened to Adam happens to us. It's possible Paul could use Adam archetypally while still thinking he was historical, but that is a different topic. When we look at Genesis 2-3, a number of things point to us thinking we should read it archetypally. For one, the Hebrew word Adam can mean a number of different things. It can refer to a personal name, the name of Adam. It can refer to a single man that isn't a personal name, which is how it's used in Genesis 2-3 as well as it can refer to humankind. In other words, it can refer to an individual man as well as everyone. Now that's fascinating. Additionally, the man in Genesis 2 is made from the dust, which is often used in the Bible to refer to mortality, something all humans are. This idea of dust, what's going on? Some of us might think in terms of chemistry. And I've seen people try to des describe what are the chemical ingredients of dust and what are the chemical ingredients of the human body and is there a way that we, we are formed from dust. And sometimes it even gets to stardust. Lots of the dust is stardust and lots of things are made from stardust, including the human body. Okay, that's reading a very advanced science in between the lines of the text, clearly not what the human author would have had in mind. The human author doesn't know anything about stardust, and the human author has a very small periodic table. No, he doesn't have any. Okay, no chemistry. Okay, so we really can't think in terms of chemistry or stardust. That doesn't honor or respect the human author's intention where authority is located. Other people think in terms of craftsmanship. You know, the molding, you know, the... Uh, the idea that God's getting his hands dirty. You know, we think of Pinocchio and Geppetto, you know, the forming a craftsmanship model. Well, that would work fine if it was clay. Dust doesn't fit. You actually can't form dust. You can form clay. Dust kind of has no cohesion. It doesn't, you can't do it. So, neither chemistry nor craftsmanship suit the context. If it's not those things, then what is dust doing here? What is it communicating? Well, we turn to the text, and fortunately, it helps us. We don't even have to go one chapter, and we find out that dust equals mortality. Dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Now that seems like an easy solution, but it's not easy at all, and it's not been a popular one. Because if you say that Adam being formed from dust means that he was mortal, we suddenly have a Paul problem. We're appalled. Okay, we have a Paul problem, sorry. Uh, it's, I know it's early, haven't had a cup of coffee yet? Okay, so we, we've got the, the difficulty because we read Paul and he says that we are subject to death because of sin, Romans 5. And we conclude from that that, oh, so Paul's saying that we were created immortal. No, that's not what Paul says. Let's read more carefully. Let's not draw assumptions, draw inferences that Paul's not saying. Let's think about it again in Genesis 3. Genesis 2, rather. We'll start there. Genesis 2. God provides a garden, and in the garden he puts two trees, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of? Yeah. Immortal people don't need a tree of life. That's a waste. 
How about a tree of Twinkies? No, never mind. Okay? <laughs> Immortal people don't need a tree of life. That's no good to them. Huh. Well, but then what would Paul be saying? What Paul is saying is, he's working with the basis, he doesn't say this, but if people were created mortal, the tree of life provides an antidote, a remedy. They had access to that remedy. But when they sinned, they lost access to the remedy. Right? The text makes a specific point in 324. They're cast out of the garden, and the cherub is set up with a flaming sword. Sharp teeth. No, it doesn't say that. Um, all to, to defend the way to the tree of life. So, because of death, no, I'm sorry, because of sin, they're subject to death. Because they have no remedy. Suddenly we're even reading Paul differently. <clears throat> but we move further. There are other passages that talk about being formed from dust. This is an important one. Psalm 103. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. Now that's the same Hebrew terminology. Formed, dust. We know that the psalmist is reflecting on, on Genesis 2. Same terminology. You can't miss it. But there's something very, very important here that we do tend to miss. Look at that. We. We are formed from dust. We're all formed from dust. Every human is formed from dust. But think about that. Paul says the same thing. Job says the same thing. Ecclesiastes says the same thing. We're all from dust. Being formed from dust, therefore, follow the logic, being formed from dust, therefore, does not describe material formation. You are formed from dust, but you were born of woman. That means being formed from dust does not preclude being born of woman. And when it says Adam was formed from dust, it's making a statement that is true of every one of us, not just uniquely true of Adam. And it's not something that is a statement about biological material human origins. It's not that for you. There's no reason to think it's that for Adam. It is not material origin. It is identity. That's what archetype deals with. Identity. This is who we are. We are mortal. We are frail. It's what all of us are. So it's intended to communicate what all humans are. Not what Adam uniquely is. It also shows the origin and location in comparison to heavenly creatures. We belong on earth while the spiritual creatures are heavenly. Later on, Adam is given the task of naming the animals. This narrative element can be interpreted as highlighting Adam's unique role as a representative of humanity. By naming the animals, he exercised authority and dominion over them and symbolizing humanity's God-given stewardship over creation. Eve is created from Adam's rib. This act of creation reinforces that idea that Adam is intimately connected to Eve. And the two together represent the archetype of male and female, symbolizing the foundational human relationship. Adam believed that Eve has been built from his rib. Now you're all saying, if he's asking that question and the answer sounds very obvious, it probably isn't. And I'm just going to listen. Okay? Does Adam believe that? No, he doesn't. How do we know? We know that because he tells us. 
First line out of his mouth. Bone of my bone. He could have stopped there if it was just rib. Bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. We're not talking about a single rib here. A side of ribs? A rack of ribs? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Give me that full slab. Yeah. Okay, so what's going on here? Again, we ask. Well, we should... It says rib in my Bible. There it is. It says rib. Well, that's a translation. We have to look at the Hebrew word. So let's look at all the other places in the Hebrew Bible where this word is used to describe anatomy. Okay, we're done. There are none. This is the only one. It's not the only occurrence of the word, however. It occurs some 20 other times. As an architectural term pertaining to one side of a pair. This side of the temple, that side of the temple. This side of the altar, that side of the altar. The, al the north side, the south side. One side of a pair. Ad God took one of Adam's sides and he's only got two. He took half of Adam and built, preferably the better half, I, I understand, took half of Adam and built the woman. They're halves of a whole. They're, excuse my language, ontologically equal. They're the same in essence, in nature. Remember, when God said it's not good for man to be alone, he wasn't talking about, he's so lonely. And he wasn't talking about needing a reproduction partner, else he wouldn't have been looking among the animals, just saying. What he's looking for is someone who is his equal to be his ally in the task that he has been given. And that's what Eve is, his ontological match. Aramaic, Septuagint Greek, Vulgate are all ambiguous on this word. They use a word that can also mean side. It could mean a rib or a bunch of ribs. It can also mean side. 3rd and 4th century AD, Rabbi Samuel Nachmani is already arguing that this should be side, not rib. Just by the logic of the passage. Now, what's going on then with the deep sleep? What's, what's happening in the passage? I mean, after all, if God's taking half of Adam, that's fairly significant surgery. Good thing he has a powerful anesthetic. Wait a second. Israelites wouldn't think of anesthetics. They don't know anything about putting someone under for surgery. We can't think of the text in modern terms. We have to read the author. And so when we think of this procedure, we ought to examine this deep sleep. You know, that's not count to ten backwards, you know. So, we do the usual thing. We look at how it's used throughout Scripture. Typical procedure. Okay, so how is this word used? It's used in a couple different ways. Sometimes it's used to refer to a situation where someone is asleep, being oblivious to danger that's lurking, that's imminent. Jonah, sleeping in the boat, even though the boat's thinking about breaking up. Breaking up's hard to do. So, Jonah, this danger is there. Okay, um, Saul is sleeping when David creeps into the camp, has the spear poised over him. Sisera, the general of the Canaanite army, Deborah and Barak in the book of Judges. He's fleeing the battle scene. He goes to the tent of Jael and Hever thinking that he's got uh, an ally there. And she gives him nice warm milk and covers him up with a nice blanket. And he dozes off. And next thing you know, she's holding a tent peg and a hammer. It's another temple story. Anyway, um, <laughs> and, Sorry, inside joke. Um, and, and there again, impending danger. 
and he's unaware of it. Okay, so sometimes this word is used in those kinds of contexts. We don't we don't want to use that here in Genesis 2. We don't want to think of the creation of women as impending danger. Okay, so that doesn't work here. We've got another very good alternative, however. And that is that sometimes the, the word is used to refer to someone who is in a visionary state. So the visionary state, they are unresponsive to the human realm, correspondingly responsive to communication from the divine realm. This is true, for instance, of Abraham in Genesis 15, the ratification of the covenant. Cuts up the animals, deep sleep, and God ratifies the covenant by the torch and censer passing between the animals. Okay? Really important moment. A spiritual watershed that is shown in a vision. So the idea that we're not talking about surgery, but we're talking about a vision where Adam sees himself cut in two, building Eve. And having seen that in a vision, when Eve is brought, he says, now I know what this is. This is, this is Isha. I am Ish, and this is Isha. Isha is just the feminine form. That's man and woman. She's the same as me. And so again, this story has to do with identity. Adam from dust has to do with identity. Edom from the side of Adam has to do with identity. Likewise, the ancient languages, as they translated this, Septuagint used ecstasis. You recognize ecstasy in that. Okay, the visionary kind of state. So, the archetypal element is nailed down in 2.24. This is why a man would leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, okay? Because this ontological match, connection, is closer than the biological relationship to his parents. And they become one flesh. That's not a reference to sex. That's not a euphemism for a sexual encounter. That's saying they restore again that ontological whole. They become one flesh again. Because that's what man and woman are. Now that's not saying if you don't get married that you're just only half a person. This is talking about the race. It's not talking about individuals. You don't go around trying to find your other half. You match. Okay. We don't do that. Okay? It, this is, this is species-wide. But again, archetypal. This pertains to everybody. Not just Eve. All womankind is from the side of all mankind. It's who we are as man and woman. Archetypal. It's the disobedience of Adam and Eve in eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Genesis 3, is often seen as a representation of humanity's collective choice to rebel against God. The consequences of this disobedience, including sin, entering the world, and the expulsion from the Garden of Eden, are understood as impacting all of humanity, making Adam and Eve archetypal figures for the human condition. In other words, we all die because we rebel against God. Romans 5, 12. So that's the archetypal Adam view. What do you think? Is this how we should understand Adam in the Bible? What are some problems with this view? Let us know in the comments below.